House Ways and Means Committee, and it's May 7th, um, and we're uh, going to be discussing, continuing a discussion on education finance this morning. We have Mark Peralt and uh, various other uh, staff people here uh, to help us with that discussion. I don't expect to resolve the issue today. I think what I'd like to do is to um, uh, be a little more clear about what some of the possibilities are, including uh, some work on an idea that um, that, that Mark and uh, Scott and I and some others have talked about, which is to uh, see if there's a way that we can get money to schools. We talked about, you know, can we get money to the Ed Fund? The answer is no. Can we give it to taxpayers? The answer is no. Is it possible to get it to schools? The answer is, yeah, we'll see, maybe. Um, and, um, and then when we have kind of uh, gotten to a place with that discussion where we've given um, staff some more work to do, that's kind of where, where we'll end up, um, then we'll shift gears and we'll hear from Abby on language that she's prepared on the uh, moving to the state collection of the property tax. And um, I know that uh, uh, Commissioner Bolio um, wants to have a chance to uh, weigh in on that, uh, which I appreciate. It's, a, it's not a new idea, but it's a new idea for this year. And, um, and uh, Bill Talbot is here with us, and we've also sent an invitation to Peter Conlon. He, I'm not sure whether he'll uh, be able to join us or not. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that House Government Operations is going to work on the short-term borrowing bill that we um, worked on yesterday and sort of moved out of the committee in memo form rather than bill form. And Robin is going to join them at, at 11.30 when they take that up and uh, talk about what, share with them what our committee's thinking was. Um, we've also, I believe, invited Karen Horn to this discussion. Um, um, yep, she's here, oh. just joined us. Um, so with that, um, unless there are some announcements from committee members, um, I'm going to, I don't see any, I'm going to move to Mark to um, always, you always get us started with the not very good right. news. I appreciate right. that. I'll do some more of that. <laughs> um, so then we'll, we'll start a discussion on what we're going to do on end finance. Okay, so um, I, I thought the, the best way to go about this might be to show you where we think we are right now. So I have a balance sheet that I call the current law balance sheet that we can look at and get an idea of what the size of the problem is. We're looking at in FY21 um, and then talk about some of the ways um, at, a, at the staff level and in, in this committee that we've tried to wrestle with how to, how to use the CRF money to address this problem. There's a couple of different ways we've been looking at it. I can walk you through them and we, we have one that may still be viable. So um, I can touch on that. So Sorsha, can you bring up the um, education fund outlook that's labeled uh, FY19 to FY21? And can you just show me the bottom of that so I can make sure it's the right one? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, we've we've seen this before. Um, I just want to remind you what's going on here. So this is a, this is an outlook for 19, 20, and 21. FY19 is actuals in the books for references. For reference, FY22 reflects the 54 million dollar. Um, 22. Amount. Where's I'm sorry. Where? You said FY22. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's so, okay. So we're right, FY20 right now. I'm just gonna remind you what happened in FY20. Yeah. Okay. okay. In FY20, down on lines four, five, six, and seven, we lost $54 million compared to the January forecast. That's really all that happened. But if you drop to the bottom line, the consequences of that are, keep, keep going all the way to the bottom. So the consequences of that are on line 27. You can see that we have no stabilization reserve. In fact, we're short $3.7 million. And down on line 31, where we previously had a $12.9 million surplus, that's gone. So this is where we think we're ending up in FY20. So now if we move on to FY21, um, I've called this, can you go back up to the top, Sorsha? Um, I've called this a current law balance sheet, but what I've, what I've done here is I've set, I've, I've put in place, so Chloe actually did this, we put in place the um, December 1 tax rate parameters on here talked about changing those and that's a possibility, but you know, just, as a, just for, for just looking at that, this is the 
these are the tax rate parameters that were in place in December. If we lower them, um, and I have, a, I have the second sheet, I can show you what they would be if they're lowered. It takes them down by about a penny and a half. We can look at that. But um, if we go back down now to the bottom again, Sorsha, um, we've lost another 112 or $113 million in non-property tax money. So that plus this $3.7 million problem leaves us with a $153 million hole. Now that assumes that the, the reserve target is res restored to the full 38 million, 5%. That may not be necessary. It assumes that we're using the December 1 tax rate parameters, which is also not necessary. But um, otherwise, I think this, this reflects where we are. So it's, it's a sizable problem, $153 million um, to balance the fund next year. So any questions on that before I- well, I, I do, because the, the, I think as a committee, we had said that we wanted to use the tax rates that we were prepared to adopt when we left yep. March 13th. Um, and uh, rather than the December 1st ones. And my recollection right. is that those are a bit lower. So I wondered if you could show us that spreadsheet as sure. well. Sure. And the, this sheet has some other stuff on it, which we can avoid for now. But so if you want to pull up the other sheet. Yeah, Mark, I didn't post that one. So give me a second and I'll put it up. Okay. On here. Okay. So the, the, this sheet also assume, uh, you know, has, has some analysis in it that we were doing around trying to you know, figure out how to get some of the, to split the rate into the COVID into the non-COVID portion. But I can show you what the um, tax rates would look like um, if we were um, assuming that uh, the rates would have been set pre-COVID, pre, pre so. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I'm checking in with committee. That that was my recollection. Is that that's that's what we that that's that was our target um, in right. terms and, of right. And the reason I, I wasn't too concerned about it on the current loss sheet is because if you go to these re rates, you bring in a little less money. So instead of yeah. having a 153 million dollar hole, you have 166 million dollar hole. Well, we need so, to, but we need to know that if we're trying yes. to figure out what the solution is. So absolutely. So yeah. the, okay. the, these are the tax rates. Um, the A, B, and C. Those are the tax rates that you likely would have set pre-COVID um, because for two reasons. One is because there was a $12.9 million surplus on the bottom line that was available for tax rate reduction. And the other reason is the school districts came in with budgets that were lower than we anticipated back in January. Instead of 5%, they were down around 4.2% or something like that. If COVID had never happened, and that was the Ed Fund outlook we were looking at, these are the tax rates that we would have ended up with. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, on March 13th, when we went home, we, we were actually, we had a bill all ready to vote. Um, and we talked about whether we should vote it or not. We decided not to, um, which in retrospect was probably, I think the, the right thing to do. Um, but I, speaking just for me, I, those are the tax rates that I feel, um, I feel, comfortable going with, they're an increase for everybody, um, but they're a, an increase that's along the lines of what we expected would happen if COVID hadn't happened. But I really feel like I, I need to check in with the committee because this is, it's a decision that is, you know, 11, 12 million, is that right? Somewhere in that neighborhood mm -hmm. yeah. that represents. Um, do other people want to weigh in on that just so that I can, um, so we can know which where we are, anybody? Uh, Sam, George, okay, good. <clears throat> so the the in, increase over last year raises an additional 11 million, is that what? No, the difference between not? December 1 and March 13th is about 11 million. Lower than March they, they were projecting. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't know if it's 11, but somewhere around there. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's something that a level at which I'm comfortable with. I mean, I still, <laughs> I feel for people that don't have an income and I'm still going to get, but, but we got, we have to, we have to do something. So that seems like a reasonable amount to try and backfill if we can, or. The, the March 13th version. Yeah. Like the, the question is, do yeah. we go with December 1 or March 13th? Just to put it as simply. March, March, March 13th is my vote. Okay, George. I feel the same way. 
<clears throat> that was the, my, the place we landed after the school budgets were passed. And so I, I really think that that's, that should be our starting point now. Yeah. Robin? Um, and, I, and I agree also, and I think that it's important to separate what's happened with the pandemic from what the reality was going to be. So people actually really know clearly what's causing the problem. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, I, I feel March 13th is fair as well. Yeah, good. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'd love to have it be lower. <laughs> I'm with Sam, yeah, or I think people are gonna have a really tough time, but I can rationalize using those March 13th rates at least. Um, and so I, as, I, I get that it makes a bigger hole, but the question mm -hmm. is going to be um, if we if we can't fill the hole entirely with CARES money, we're raising revenue from somebody because um, that's how we get money into the Ed Fund. And I like to keep it as low as possible on property taxpayers because um, I don't think they're going to have the wherewithal to, um, to pay. Anyone else want to weigh in on it? Okay, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna treat that as a settled question until we revisit it. Um, is that all right? Okay. Okay, so so going forward, I'll, I will uh, use those tax rate parameters on any of the yeah. education fund outlets yeah. we look at. Yeah. Um, and again, just keep in mind that the the hole that needs to be filled is um, 167 instead of 153. Not not a big difference when it's so bad already. I don't think so. So then, how how are we gonna address this, we've been working at the staff level and in here over the last couple of weeks. And there have basically been, apart from the feds coming to the rescue with more flexibility in terms of the CRF money or a COVID-4 or something like that, in the absence of that, we've looked at three ways to try to use a portion of this $1.25 billion to solve this problem. And because of the, the bells and whistles and all the constraints that are in the CRF, um, guidance. It's been really, really difficult to do it. And we've actually had issues where we're getting subsequent guidance that's even more restrictive than the guidance we initially got. So I'll just walk you through quickly what we, what we, what we were thinking and where we are right now. So initially we thought, wow, all you have to do is take that $167 million out of that $1.25 billion and put it into the education fund as a revenue source. And you've solved the problem. Tax rates are where you want them to set. And we've fill that gap in there with the, the corona, uh, you know, virus relief fund money, problem solved. That was clearly, even from the first guidance, it was clear that the feds were not gonna allow us to directly replace lost revenues in that way. So that idea didn't last long. The second idea, which we spent quite a bit of time on so far, is to try to take some of that CRF money and direct it right back to taxpayers so that they're able to pay their bills, even if, the tax rate increase is built into the rate, they would have money in hand in order to pay the bills. And we could address the problem that way and use as much of that CRF money as necessary. The second set of guidance that came out um, just I think on the 27th or last week specifically prohibits the use of it for that. And the, the actual example used replacing property tax monies by putting you know, money into taxpayers' hands to do it. So it looks like that option is precluded. So that eliminates putting it into the fund. It eliminates, I think, sending it back directly to taxpayers. So the third option we've looked at is, can we get this money directly to the school districts in, in, order, for, in, in order to use the money? And I think the answer to that is yes, with a big caveat. And the caveat is that any spending that the schools do of this money has to qualify as COVID-related eligible, uh, eligible costs. So there's a bunch of questions that raises. First off is, can schools identify enough money um, in their FY21 spending that would be COVID-19 eligible? So that's one question. The other question is, there's a, this would be a huge, um, I don't know if it's huge, it would be an administrative headache because schools would have to keep very close records as to what they were spending the money on and AOE would have to then collect that information. I don't, we have to do an application process or something where schools said, we have this COVID-19 related expense. We'd like you to reimburse us out of the CRF fund that's in AOE and address it that way. Um, but um, we're still um, in the midst 
of trying to work this through and um, think to see if it's valid. There was one issue about whether or not um, money could be subgranted from AOE to the um, individual districts. And I think that that's, that's probably permissible. Um, so I think the, the, the question is really whether or not um, schools are going to be able to identify COVID-19 related costs, apply to the agency for them and get the money and have it work out that way. It's a really, really roundabout, inelegant way to deal with this, but um, so far it's the only way we can figure out how to get the CRF money, the 1.25 billion that the state has received from the feds and use it to solve this problem without running into problems with the regulations. Uh, Emily. Um, the schools are all re already receiving other COVID relief funds, is that correct? That there, sort of there, is yeah, there, a different way? Yeah, there, there's an elementary and secondary emergency um, fund that came out initially. That's the 27 million we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, AOE is working on that now. I don't know how that comes out, but that's, that's also money that could potentially be used to close this gap. And the way that would work is um, if districts receive that money after the close of this fiscal year, it could be treated, I think, as an offsetting revenue for their, against their budget next year. But um, AOE is working on that right now. I don't have an answer for that, but that is a potential $27 million help. And they would have to, am I, do they have to account for that in the same um, sort of way that we're imagining they would need to account for this? They need to account for it, but the 12 permissible uses of that money are way, way broader than what the CRF money is. Okay, Basically, you. you can use it to keep teachers employed. You can use okay. it to uh, provide remote learning. You can use it for just about anything. The so CRF, could, money, CRF money is a different different animal. So. so we could ask them to use that money, if that money winds up in next year instead of this year, we can hope, then they could use that money for more flexible purposes and save this money possibly for the narrower purpose. I think so. I don't know actually who has control of that money because the money goes directly to from the feds to the agency of education. The education agency is then directed to send that money out to supervisory unions based on a specific yeah. formula. So we don't have control over the amount or how much it is. And you know, so yes. Uh, Jim. Um, thanks. Um, Mark, similar to Emily's question, I wondered if we end up using the 27 million for certain things that the feds would say, well, you can't use the big pot because you already covered that hole. I mean, you know, keeping the left hand and the right hand far enough apart so we don't get accused of double dipping. Yeah, it would make it would make sense to use the $27 million to cover things that you can cover with that money and that you're not able to cover with the CRF yeah. money, I suppose. Yeah. I'm Understood. Thank you. But that all sort of assumes that we control it. That that's that's correct. And it's like we're and, you know the problem with this and the reason it's going to be so difficult is we have 150 plus you know 154 districts, all doing this independently, all in different situations, all with different levels of need. I'm assuming under COVID-19 and different numbers of people being able to pay and not pay their bill. But somehow we have to you know AOE would be have to be able to oversee that whole process and make sure that when we get audited down the line a couple of years, we've got sufficient documentation from the districts so that uh, you know, the money isn't uh, reclawed, reclawed back to the feds. So, so, um, so the thing that, um, I mean, you've touched on it, but the thing that um, I'm sort of trying to sort out is, you know, we have how many districts, 154? Um, I think so, yeah. Whatever the number, somewhere like that. All, yeah. all, at some point, every one of them will have a budget. Um, we have a we have a few stragglers, but basically, they, they will all have budgets that are adopted in some way. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how the um, even the 27 million. But if we if we add to that in you know by quadrupling it or whatever we're talking about here, uh, how that cares money is going to impact the size of those budgets. Um, and whether, I guess it's sort of what you were saying, are we getting are we getting the money to the districts that need it? Um, and what what are what are districts gonna end up? 
at the end of the year, if they voted a, a million dollar budget, are they going to end up with a million one or with 900,000? I mean, what, just sort of because of the vagaries of the way the federal law is working. Um, anyway, that, just throwing out the worry, I guess. Yeah. Um, Scott, you've been thinking about this a fair amount. Well, George raised his hand, so. Let me hear from George first, and then I'll. <clears throat> Actually, why don't we go ahead and let Scott go? Because mine's a little different direction. Okay, uh, Scott. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I have been thinking about um, using a grant um, in substitute for some ed, ed spending, uh, kind of on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, I think we. I mean, it's just an idea, and I think. I've had some conversations with uh, JFO and Ledge Council, and I know the chair has as well. And there are definitely some things to figure out, but um, it might be the best worst idea that we have right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have some thoughts about this question about so that so the two issues and and Mark has touched on them, but there's the administrative difficulty both for town for districts um and for AOE just the the sheer sort of volume of documentation and so on but then then there's also the question about whether the distribution is actually going to get to the places that really need it you know sort of this equity I guess I call it an equity issue um have you thought about the second part of that as, as you've been working with this well, you know, I, I, um, I was, my thought process was along the lines of is to make the, this, you know, have it be a census block grant. And so it would just, it would replace one for one ed fund, ed spending dollars. Um, I hadn't um, contemplated trying to do anything within that to try to, you know, steer more monies to districts that are going to be more affected at the expense of other districts that are going to be less expect, um, affected. Um, that makes sense on a lot of levels. It does add a degree of complexity to it, though. Well, I was also thinking that it, that some districts are going to have an easier time documenting than others. You know, some of the districts that are more sophisticated are going to have an easier time. Um, That's true. And I had also thought of maybe, I mean, I mean, this is kind of, I mean, we're getting, this is crazy talk, but I mean, if, if there was some way, if, of districts that could show more than, more than um, the grant could somehow um, give dollars to districts that were short, you know, an inter-district transferring mechanism or something. I mean, but that's something, boy, we've never done anything like that. I mean, and, 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 the, and the second district would still need to meet the spending requirements under COVID-19, yeah. so, you know. I don't know, yeah. Uh, Sam. But, Oh, sorry, Mark, you go ahead. Well, I was going to jump in. I, I, I think that the part of the problem is we cannot direct this money. The, the $27 million is going on out under a specific formula. And the larger part of money that we were trying to draw from to close this up can only be used for COVID-19 related expenses. So it can't be directed. It has to be the other way. The direction is going to be coming from the districts to the AOE saying, we just spent the million dollars of COVID-19 related um, you know, expenditures reimburse us for that amount of money to replace the money that we've taken back. Mm -hmm. But there's no guarantee that they're going to match up. I mean, if we took down the education payment by X amount of money, it's going to affect everybody by a specific amount, how much they'll actually be able to recoup through this um, application process to AOE is unclear. And it's probably not going to match up dollar for dollar. So you're going to have winners and losers to the extent that you have a district that has um, that has a reduction in their education spending because we claw back some of the money and is not able to get enough money for COVID-19 relief, they're going to have a deficit and they're going to have to carry that forward into the next year. So it's, it's a really messy way to go about this. It's just the only way we've been able to think about it, getting any of this money into the Ed Fund. Yeah. Sam and Emily and George. So this is could you direct it out to districts based on their equalized pupil counts or no mm. that's not okay 
Emily. Nice idea, though. <laughs> and, um, then, and then I and then I was going to say, can can you use their uh, you know your pr properly weighted counts? <laughs> oh, no, you weren't. <laughs> Uh, Emily. <laughs> Thanks for that one, Sam. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's going to be hard to go back to real life and not be able to mute people. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, do we have a sense of when we're going to have those final numbers from AOE about the first bucket of money? And then um, I've heard you say both. It's going to need to be um, a reimbursed expense and talking about clawbacks. And so I'm wondering, is there specific guidance from the feds about that? Or are we just worried about making sure that we don't wind up in a clawback situation and protecting ourselves? Um, there, there is guidance. We're just having trouble making the guidance work with the solution okay. because, because they precluded using it for making up for lost revenues, which is yeah. really where our problem is. We're trying to think of workarounds. And so far they've cut us off the past twice so far now. And we've got one more here, which may be possible. And we don't want to send the money to districts and sort of trust that they can make their numbers around CARES related funding relate because they might, it would be harder for them to be in a clawback situation than for us to be in a clawback situation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how that would be because it would, the, the money would be going from AOE out to the, to the yeah. district. I, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't know, who, you're asking who would have to defend it that it's, that it's COVID-19 related. Yeah, I guess I was wondering what would happen if we asked the districts to defend it after the fact. Yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, the way we, I was thinking about it working would be that there would be an appropriation of the $1.25 million, some portion of that to AOE to keep it mm -hmm. a fund for this purpose. They would set up a, a grant application process. Yep. The district would apply for it and say, we have mm -hmm. a million or we have a million and a half dollars of COVID-19 related expenses, reimburse us for that money. And ideally we'd get everybody back to what their budget is, but that's not gonna work out exactly, I don't think. I think we'd have to specify who has the risk on it. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and there, there, may be, there may be stuff in the guidance on that too as well. I just haven't, you know, I was looking right. at the other restrictions. But. And just sort of a final detail, there is, when I think about the um, administrative logistics of this, it seems incredibly important to it actually working at all. And so yes. there is a decent chunk of money for AOE to deal with the administrative yes. part of this, right? Um, I, think that, I think that AOE could justify using some of the money, um, the COVID money to administer this. If they had to you know, bring on an employee or a couple to do it, um, I think that they could do that with COVID-19 money. I think that would be a legitimate use of it. But again, you know, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Bill, I realize that you don't you don't get a hand to raise. So, you go ahead, <laughs> Bill Tell. So, the, the, they'll probably be subject. To, the, the districts would probably be subject to a federal single audit. The trigger is five hundred thousand dollars. So, some of them might be under that. Um, but the, it's all their federal money, not just one grant. So, whatever the funds receive will likely have to be audited and for compliance. So that's one way, and, the, and then the agency is responsible for monitoring any grants it gives out, any federal grants. So it'll it'll have to hold them accountable as well. I guess the question, though, is that if if it's if it didn't fall within the guidelines, who who, be, they, who has they, to come up with it? Um, they, would, they would be on the hook for it. They being the districts, the recipients, as opposed to AOE. Okay. Um, Let's see, I've got George Scott and Sam. Oh, maybe, yeah. So thinking about it just a little bit differently, um, when I look at the, the Ed Fund balance sheet, a number that jumps out at me is the property tax credit, which is in the pretty close to the number we're talking about here as needing, right? So uh, two, two questions. Um, one is, is could we transfer that to the general fund, the obligation for the property tax credit, where the general fund may have a whole lot more possible offsets, um, which are COVID related to that money. The second thought was, okay, so we've determined how much this is. What if we doubled this, extended the range so it covered everybody? 
Um, it's, you know, people's incomes are dropped off dramatically. That's COVID related. We need to give more property tax um, credit by, per our system. Would that work? Well, you can go talk with Kitty about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that, um, I don't mean to sound so flip, but it, it's, I agree that if there's room in the general fund um, that, you know, we, we shouldn't, we should keep that communication going. Um, but I will also say that the general fund is going to um, be in, I think this year they're okay, but there's so many restrictions on the use of the COVID money that it's not helping out a lot of sort of regular general fund kinds of things. Um, and the income tax is um, going to um, suffer next year for sure. Um, and that will be at the end of fiscal 21. So I guess I'm just saying it's not like the general fund is is uh, is okay, um, but you know I I hear what you're asking and I I think it's worth a conversation. Um, Scott and Sam. Oh, but the other piece of it was no, George, you go ahead. The yeah. other piece of it was um, increasing the property tax credit and oh, using yeah. the money for that, using the co the cares money for that as a COVID expense. Yeah. What do you think, Mark? Okay. Well, I, I just I pulled up the language. It says may fund may fund payments be used to assist impacted property owners with the payment of their property taxes. Fund payments may not be used for government replacement, including provision of assistance to meet tax obligations. So I and I don't know how strictly to read that, but it sounds like you cannot put money in taxpayers' hands in order to meet the object tax shortfalls. So um, just to, you know, address one of the paradigms that seems to be driving our thinking here, um, which is that there seems to be an expectation that all of the, that um, we're going to use care, we're going to use CARES money to pay off all of the borrowing in FY21. And I wonder if maybe we should start looking at borrowing mechanisms that don't require a one year payback. Uh, say that to me again. Um, the, the paradigm that we're working with here that we're trying to fill, fill is that all of this borrowing um, is going to need to be repaid in FY21, um, which makes that a really big number in FY21 and maybe we shouldn't circle back to the borrowing conversation and see if there aren't longer term um, mechanisms that might work better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and in which case we need to also be looking at 22. Maybe even beyond that, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Peter, oh, Sam, you were on my list. You go ahead and then Peter. Thank you. Um, if you put where? your down, I forget you, so. <laughs> No, I, I didn't put it down, did I? Yeah. Oh, uh, oh whoops. That's okay. Oh. Um, yeah. Where, where is the administration? Like, where is the AOE? Like, do they have any ideas? Like, I mean, I feel like we're kind of uh, stumbling around in the dark and kind of need some direction from the executive branch. Like, I mean, we're just, I don't know. It's, can, can we can we at least get them to come in and say that they don't have any ideas? Yeah. So my, oh, my notes, uh, I just want to show you my notes. My notes say for Tuesday, AOE. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree, and it has been a little bit frustrating um, that you know the it, it this is a very significant part of state government, and it's a lot of money, and um, the administration has not. Um, in spite of invitations has not really been present for the discussion. And so um, I, at some point, uh, whether they are or not, we need to figure out a solution. Um, but I will, uh, they're on my list to come in and I, um, thank you. 
Peter. Um, I, I wanted to um, go back to Scott's uh, reframing of the solution to uh, perhaps be a three to five year solution rather than a one or two year solution. And I have, I have uh, uh, rattling around the uh, observation by Treasurer Pierce that there was that additional, I forgot the acronym or the name of it, that we could borrow. And depending on the uh, performance and use of that, that some of it may be forgiven. And I distinctly remember it was an intermediate, uh, a, a, a bit of help over an intermediate term like three to five years. And I just think uh, understanding what the terms of forgiveness would be um, and, and what it in the end would add uh, over that term of repayment is worth exploring. And I agree with Scott. Mark, you've done some looking at borrowing. Um, do you want to? Uh, um, we, we haven't actually done that much. I, I think that the, uh, the mechanism that um, Representative Anthony is referring to, uh, I think Beth Pierce said that that would not work for this purpose. Right. That's the municipal two. liquidity facility. Yeah, I can never remember the name either, but yes, and I think it's like a two year limitation. There's a bunch of other constraints on it in terms of size and things like that. Um, we did just take a look to get an idea of like if you went out and borrowed the full amount of money um, to cover this gap and then paid it back over say 10 years, you'd be looking at two or three cents on the tax rate every year for that for that time. But that that that's a that would be a way to address it. But um, put more pressure on property taxes for a long time. Yeah. Um, Bill. Oh, Jim, you had your hand up. Did you put it back down? Mark explained pretty much clarified what my question was. So I'm all, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Bill. So yeah. Yeah. In, my note, in my notes from Beth Pierce, uh, she talked about long-term uh, borrowing. Uh, FEMA disaster relief program, mm -hmm. five to 10 year deficit term. I think that the, the um, borrowing may be a piece of the solution, but um, the, the worry I keep having is what is fiscal 22 um, look like? And, and then, you know, obviously when we get to 23, we're really kind of guessing, but, um, but to run it out is because if what we do is borrow to get out of the current problem, I mean, we're borrowing to get out of 20, out of 20. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing. We're doing it by using reserves and so on. Um, but if we also borrow for 21, um, that just shifts the problem to 22. And if 22 looks equally bad or almost as bad or whatever, um, we're just gonna um, postpone the reckoning, I guess. Uh, other, other thoughts? Um, So I, I'm thinking of trying to make sort of a uh, list of what, uh, not a list so much, but some idea of what um, what we would like staff to work on um, over the next few days. Hopefully they get a little break on the weekend. Um, George, did you wanna jump in? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the other unpleasant choice is to try to raise revenue um, to, to cover this. Um, and, you know, there, there are some things which I have championed for many years, which, um, you know, have other benefits can reduce our costs elsewhere, but, um, things like a tobacco tax increase, which hasn't been done since 2015 in Vermont. Um, you know, a, the, we talked about the sales tax for candy. That's only three bucks, but you know, one dollar or three million. But a one dollar uh, increase in tobacco tax would be six point seven million bucks. There's the old sugar sweetened beverage tax, which is twenty five million dollars. Um, you know, uh, but somehow it seems that. Um, raising some revenue may need to be part of what we do. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Well, just to be really clear, we don't 
um, if we, to the extent we can't use CARES money, we're raising revenue. Um, it's just, we're raising it from property taxpayers. So there isn't a way to resolve this um, without getting more revenue into the fund. Um, that's why we're pushing so hard just to figure out if we can use CARES money. Um, but if we can't, that's really where we're gonna end up. Um, and I also, on my list is the cloud as well, which is, um, you know, not um, also not gonna solve a $167 million problem, but um, was something that we were prepared to do when we left in March. Uh, Peter. Um, I just following up uh, George's uh, observation, I, I also would love to know whether there's any uh, hope uh, of exploring revenue options. I gather, I'm sure that's a executive branch, dis branch discussion that like Sam, I wish were sooner than later. But one way to think about it, even though the um, uh, opportunities that uh, George listed and that you did as well, the cloud, uh, while they don't cover the principal, they would cover, I think, largely the carrying costs of an intermediate term debt. So that uh, essentially, we'd be able to pay it back uh, and the interest would be paid by uh, a, an assortment of relatively small uh, incidental tax uh, uh, proposals. Um, are there other thoughts? Um, George? Can somebody remind me what the uh, um, amount of money associated with the cloud tax that we had, were talking about before this all happened? How much additional Graham. revenue are we talking about? Graham? There. He's here, but he may not be. He might be double tasking, multitasking. There. Oh, sorry. I, I missed the question. I was, I was dealing with the toddler. What was the question? Uh, the amount of revenue that we were estimating from the cloud change. Um, it was about $7 million. Um, however, I would probably want to revisit it in light of the current economic situation. It might be doing better than that. It might be doing a little bit worse depending on what right. types of software people are buying. Candy, which was discussed, I think would be a little bit lower than $3 million. Um, I think so, that's I'm eating it every day. <laughs> <laughs> some people are eating a lot more, um, yeah. mm -hmm. but, but some people are probably not going to the corner stores much, um, things like that. Um, and depending upon when it went into effect, candy is a very cyclical um, sales pattern. Hell, like Halloween and Easter are huge buying patterns. So if you say start it in January, you would miss the holiday or the Halloween season. Like that. So there, roughly call start between three and seven would be, you know, something you can sort of think about right now. I must say, I've never thought about timing a revenue bill around Halloween before. <laughs> this might be here to think that. <laughs> Maybe we should tax pumpkins. The what? Maybe we should tax pumpkins. <laughs> um, well, I do gather that the alcohol taxes revenues right. are up. Right. Yeah, and it may be that the what we end up with is a mix of things. Um, you know, so um, I. I I find it hard to believe at the moment that we're going to use CARES money for the whole 167. On the other hand, there's the 30 that's there. Um, there's the possibility of not filling all the reserves. You know, there may be some room in there. Um, and of course, not filling the reserves is essentially a short term loan because we have to fill it. It's, it's an obligation, but it, there's not a carrying cost to it or other than the use of the money. Um, so, you know, it may be that some revenues, some, um, some uh, CARES money, some, you know, shorting the reserve, some, you know, so, sort of a mix of things is where we end up. I don't, uh, um, I, I don't see a, a, a single bullet. Um, I was gonna answer that. It sounded like it was in my house. <laughs> uh, uh, Peter. I just uh, one of the ones that I thought uh, Scott had shown us a, a range of tiers. If we change the minimum, one of the tiers would bring in about eight million, as I recall. It goes to the general fund, Peter. It doesn't go to the ed fund. 
I don't remember that. Which tiers are you referring to, Peter? He's talking about the minimum tax on the, it, it's the whole corporate tax um, thing, but it- Oh, not, the corporation, yeah. On money. So we are gonna have problems right. to solve in the general fund and yeah. um, probably, well, we may have to do something this year, but we, won't, we don't have to do something before July 1. So um, Robin and George. Um, while we're talking about possible tax options, I'm going to bring up again my um, luxury tax on clothing of $200 or more, and whether that would be, um, I, I don't think we've ever asked for how much we would get from that, but um, I think that's worth well, looking at too. Graham, do you have that estimate or did you? Uh, yeah, I did that last year, I think, and I, I but I think the threshold was at $150, and I believe Fine. that one was was um, 7 million, but again, with the caveat of, you know, people buying patterns right now right. during the, the pandemic. Right. Okay, That's, it's something. Yeah, uh, George. And a bunch of small pieces might be what we need to do. I mean, the other discussion that we have had many times does not feel like a good time to do it to me, but is expanding the sales tax to services. Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't feel like a time to do that, but that, I mean, that that is out there. It's sales tax, it goes to the Ed Fund. Um, and then the, the, the one other thought is some kind of separate COVID sales tax surcharge that we just put on temporarily while we're dealing with uh, this disaster. Mm -hmm. So instead of expanding the base, raise the rate temporarily. Yes, temporarily, in a clearly temporary manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. The COVID yeah. tax, the COVID sales tax. Oh, yeah, sounds awful. Emily. <laughs> I just wanted to understand what you meant by surcharge, and now I do, so thank you. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, there... admittedly, admittedly, it's ugly, but they're all ugly choices here. Yeah. yeah. I, re I really, I would like to explore, I think Bill mentioned it, that uh, FEMA disaster loan five to 10 years. I think I'd like to explore that as being part of the mix. Okay. Yeah, we will. Um, I, I have to admit that I'm sort of unconvinced about borrowing money other than, other, other than maybe not filling the full reserves, but, um, but yeah, we'll look at it, and if that's where the committee wants to go, I'm I'm fine. Um, not my first choice. Uh, so, Mark, have you got the whole list of all the um, things that we are looking at, and Graham, I guess, as well, because some of them are on the all those revenue things. And I, I thought it all might also make sense to um, see if we can find out um, what districts think about their COVID nineteen related costs. Yeah. Next year, yeah. Um, if they right. thought about what they might right. they might be running into, because it may it may be more than we expect, and it may be enough there. So. Yeah. Well, so um, keeping the the getting cares money to the schools concept on the table, um, and next week we will hear from AOE sort of generally, but also specifically on this, and then we also need to hear from um, the superintendents and the school boards and um, get you know, we can do some work ahead of time with them, but um, I, I would want to have them be able to speak to the committee about what some of the issues are that they see and so on. So, um, so we will set all that up. So Jim and Emily. Yeah, thanks. Um, I agree. I think it's time to look at a list of the things that we've sort of kicked around. Yeah. In the, in yeah. The part of this puzzle. And also, Mark, as you were saying, um, this from the schools as they begin to work through what could they spend it on. Um, that's an exercise for them more than us. I, that I, know what's going on. I can't tell with. who it is, but uh, I couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. You want to try it again? Sure. Um, yeah. I would agree that a list of possibilities, a number of them suggested today that have merit, and see what, what, what they are and decide what the committee thinks about them. And then also, Mark, as you were saying, um, what might the school spend the money on? 
uh, it's a, more of an exercise for them and AOE than it is for us, but it would be nice to see what the thoughts are. This is COVID related, you know, the things where, the, where, they, where they can clearly spend it. At least if we had that um, and the list of possibilities from our end, we might be able to narrow down the target a little bit. And I also agree with Janet, I'm really reluctant about borrowing. Um, it's money now, but I don't know. I'm worried about how, how and when we pay it back. And we are borrowing for 20, essentially. Understood, understood, yeah. the longer term stuff. Um, yeah, that, that, this feels like enough to me. But, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, we'll, we'll get more information on it. Uh, Emily, you had your hand up. Are you still wanting to speak? I do, um, thanks. I'm also nervous about long-term borrowing given how profoundly more unknown the future is than even it usually is. Um, and to the laundry list of small taxes, um, I'd love to add bringing beer up to one of the <laughs> levels just to be really unpopular. And um, to show you the fridge. <laughs> um, if other sort of um, ideas for the laundry list come to mind before we meet again, what's the best way to, should I just send them to Mark and Graham and you, Janet? Yeah, or? That'd be great. And I, I, I don't send them to the whole committee because I want to be careful not to get into a committee discussion on yep. email. Um, but yeah, that'd be great. If you, if you um, want to just let people know that you're thinking about it, just blind copy the committee, but um, so that we don't end up in a discussion. That's all. But yeah, yeah. Uh, do send ideas in because it's, um, it's idea time. Uh, Scott. I would just make the comment about, you know, some I don't remember who said it. Well, if you borrow, who pays that back? Well, uh, whatever you don't raise in CARES money or consumption taxes is going to get paid by property taxpayers. So if you borrow it, you just spread that property tax burden over a number of years, but it gets picked up by property taxpayers. Yeah. I guess that's probably, maybe that's why I don't like it. Yeah. Well, yeah, they got to pay it somehow, but yeah. Um, uh, anything else? Um, okay. So we're going to shift gears um, and, oh, George, I'm sorry. I looked away. Go ahead. You're A lot of people look away from me. Um, <laughs> I, I just wonder if Graham has any idea if we were going to do a property, I mean, a um, sales tax surcharge, how big a surcharge would we need um, to raise you know, say a uh, hundred million dollars. Um, I think based upon the numbers that I have from Tom Cabet on the fiscal year 21, his first pass on the sales tax, an additional one percentage point would raise somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 million dollars per additional point. So if you made it a seven percent percent sales tax, you would raise somewhere between 60 and 70 million dollars. Um, based upon what he's forecasting as of April 28th. Um, so whatever that forecast is for fiscal year 21 will obviously change whatever that extra point will raise. And that's assuming no elasticity of demand, the extra point won't drive down sales in Vermont, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that would, if, even that would require some of these other solutions to um, such as not filling the reserves um, and using the 30 million, for example. Um, yeah, you still, you still have still. A, a, way, a little bit to go. Yeah, it's close to there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the question um, would be what, sort of what's, what's most manageable for people and what's most, most palatable for people. Um, and sort of assuming, um, I'm still starting with the assumption that we need to get we need to get the money to schools. You know, they're not saving money at this point, um, and or they're not spending less. And um, we can't burden taxpayers any more than what they basically agreed to when they adopted their budgets. Yeah. You mean uh, property taxpayers? Is that what I, I didn't say that, right? What did I say? I said something else. 
No, you just said taxpayers. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, property taxpayers. Yeah. Uh, any, any other ideas? Um, yeah, so, uh, I don't see other hands anyway. Um, so do share ideas with Mark and me and Graham probably would be the, the best thing to do. And we'll come back to this on Tuesday and hopefully, and we'll have AOE here um, and we'll have made, had some communication with the school districts about how feasible the CARES plan is with them. All right, Abby, we're now talking about state collection of um, the education tax. Okay, great. So um, for the record, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Council, um, the language that is posted on the website um, requires the Department of Taxes to work with a list of stakeholders, um, towns, so Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association, as well as bank and credit union associations to propose a plan um, for implementing transitioning the responsibility for billing and collection of the statewide education property tax, transitioning that away from municipalities and to the Department of Taxes. So sorry, that's sort of a mouthful. Um, do we have the draft up on the page? Oh, sure. We probably should have put it up there. So there you go. Um, great, okay. So the, um, it's more than just a study. Um, it is a, an actual plan for implementing um, and requires fiscal estimates as well as legislative um, language. It is required January 15th of next year of 2021. That's typically when reports and studies and any sort of reporting to the legislature are required. I assume that that was enough time, but that date could be changed. Um, the Office of Legislative Council and the Joint Fiscal Office would um, provide legal and fiscal assistance. And then in the second subsection, um, there's the list of the issues that would need to be addressed in this plan. Um, so I can just read through those if that's unless there are any questions on the first um, subsection A. Uh, I don't see questions. So why don't you go ahead and then uh, and then sort of I want the committee to be thinking sort of generally is this the approach that you were anticipating and that people are comfortable with and um, ov overall and then we can if it is then we can get into the details of what we're looking what we're asking for. Um, but I want people to focus on sort of also the general um, concept here. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so the um, list of issues, and I actually can share um, with Sorsha uh, to put online and to share with the committee. Um, back in 20, it was 2011, the tax department did a feasibility study on this, um, and that lays out a lot of the issues. Um, and then in the 2012 session was the last time this was really taken up in detail. And that's where I pulled a lot of these issues from. Um, so within this implementation plan, these are the issues that need to be addressed. Um, adjustments to the assessment calendar. So um, any lodging of the grand list, but any um, grievances, at that whole process leading up to creating the grand list, the calendar might need to be shifted if the state is billing and collecting instead of towns. Um, also establishing billing dates, whether it would be one, two, three, or four, currently towns can make up to four installment dates. Um, the format of the bills, um, the establishment of collection dates, so when taxpayers are actually paying, the methods of payment, um, including withholding, I believe that was one of the potential options proposed back in 2012 or that was under discussion withholding um, from income tax, um, other methods of payment, such as um, through escrow, um, through banks, which is why the banks and credit unions were included as um, stakeholders the department would need to consult with. And then whether there would be any early payment discount and how the existing early payment discount for towns when they make their ed education property tax payments, whether that would, you know, a conforming change would be to repeal that, but what, what sort of discounts would be allowed or not allowed for taxpayers. Um, subdivision four talks about the authority to collect delinquent payments um, and any penalties and interest that would be charged, whether that would stay with the towns or would also move to the state. 
Um, and actually I'm looking at my ordering. It might've also made sense to include sub seven under this four, but it's in there anyway. I just wanna highlight that um, appeals and abatements. But. When you turn sure. your head, I, I lose you. I don't know if others do, but. Oh. Um, I'm sorry, I have two screens, so I'm looking I, at my. I, get, I gathered and I'm just, it, it drops out when you shift when you shift back and forth. Yeah. So I'm just a little closer. I also can't see myself now, so I don't know what you're seeing. Um, okay, my, cat, my cat is asleep, so it should, she shouldn't disturb us. Um, so I was just on subdivision four regarding delinquent payments. Who would have the authority to administer those? Um, subdivision five having to do with the administration of the education payments to school districts. Um, and that's currently primarily administered by the agency of education, the treasurer is receiving the payments and then the agency of um, education is determining the amounts that go out to school districts. So how that would be dealt with under this new collection system where the department is collecting instead of towns. Um, subdivision six uh, makes reference to locally voted exemptions. So when towns um, are allowing for certain exemptions from um, local property tax and from education property tax is uh, usually re results in an agreement for the taxpayers to cover the amount of the education property tax payment. So how that would be dealt with in this new system um, where towns are no longer collecting that. Um, so how would they continue to make up for what they've voted to exempt locally? Um, and then subdivision seven, as I um, was referring to in terms of delinquencies, um, penalties and interest, who would have jurisdiction over the appeal process, who would have jurisdiction over abatements, which currently is entirely at this at the town level, um, except for very limited circumstances. Um, and then the next three points are more related to the plan itself. So the timing, when the, when the transition would occur, how long that transition period would take, um, how many years it would be rolled out. Um, and then the fiscal impact of the rollout during the transition, but also going forward to um, anticipate the cost to the state of actually administering the collection and billing and um, any other administrative costs. And then a catch-all in subdivision 10 for any other consideration related to this transition. And that's, I did not put an effective date, um, but I assumed it would just be captured in, if this were going into the miscellaneous tax bill, for example, that it would be effective on passage and it re would require the report on January 15th. Great, thank you. Um, some of this sounds really familiar to me, um, <laughs> to admit. Um, so questions, or um, also just looking for the committee to, um, you know, I think there was general interest in pursuing something like this. I guess the first question is this: is this uh, is this the right path? Um, and um, were, you, were you expecting something different, more decisive, or less decisive? Um, so anybody's got any thoughts? Um, I'm looking for hands, and I don't see any. George. I'd love to hear from the commissioner. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyone else got any? Uh, he's here, so uh, was anyway. Is I'm here, something? I'm on the phone. I'm having a, a bit of an internet uh, challenge. <laughs> okay, let me see if they've got anything from anyone on the committee and then we'll shift gears to you. Um, sure. oh, doesn't look like it. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for being with us here and uh, for looking at this and I think really short notice. Sure, happy to happy to be here. Uh, Craig Volio, Tax Commissioner, apologize. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, hear you fine, can't okay. see. Perfect. You. My, my internet went down and I have very bad cell reception in my house, so I was surprised I was able to call in, mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad I am. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I, I think I think my testimony on this is fairly brief. Um, you know, generally we're open to this idea, open to have this conversation. As the uh, chair mentioned, this isn't a new idea. Um, I think that the timing is generally right. It's 
the timing is the only thing that I have any hesitation about. Um, but we're about we are starting our new uh, integrated property tax management system uh, project right now to uh, upgrade the statewide grand list. Um, so this is uh, generally the right time to be talking about this as well. Um, so we're open to it. Uh, the, the January of next year, um, you know, the only thing that I would want to say to that is is just the unknown with the COVID-19 pandemic, right? If there's another spike in the fall or the winter, and that requires response from, from the executive branch and the legislative branch to address, I don't know what that does to workloads. Um, you know, the other thing I would mention is, is starting the uh, implementation for, for the IPTMS. We're expecting that we'll be live with some pilot towns in 2021 and then really launching it wholesale in the spring of 22. So I do want to be transparent to the committee, um, you know, about what timing expectations would be to be able to take that over. Um, it may be uh, um, a big undertaking to try to make it part of that initial launch, which means we may not be looking at fiscal year 22 for this. Um, it may be beyond that, but I, I just wanted to, to let that be known. But again, generally uh, positive to the idea, uh, open to having this discussion. I know that VLCT ha has, has deemed that they're also open to having the discussion where I, I don't know where the clerks and treasurers stand. So that would be another important facet um, to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would also say on the timing, uh, I'm, I have some worries about how to coordinate with all of these folks right now, right? With so many towns shut down, being in May, trying to get a report by January or a plan by January, that could present one challenge. So, you know, if the committee is willing to give some additional time, I think that's useful. Um, but th those are my my brief thoughts and, and my my first impressions. Great. Uh, let me see if there's questions. Um, I'll, I'll give you, I don't see any, so I'll give you, uh, thank you for, um, for being open to it. Uh, in terms of timing, I think if we do this, my inclination is to keep the January 15th date, but understand that this is, we, this, this is a complicated and cooperative effort. It's not, we're, we're not going to be sitting there on January 16th and say, gee, you didn't make it because, you know, that there was a spike in cases in December. Um, we're going to work with you in terms of, of getting the information as, you know, as, expeditiously as possible, but understanding the weird circumstances that we're in. So, um, but if we don't put a date in, um, then we don't get, you know, we, we need to get a lot of people at the table. And I think the date helps us do that. Um, so that's kind of my reaction. I, I don't, you know, that's just, if I'm back um, and back in this position, then um, I can definitely say that I, we would be um, working with you in terms of getting a proposal to land at a at a reasonable time. Um, other people want to weigh in. Sam, you had your hand up a minute ago. I was just going to ask for what his alternative date might be, but I also accept your explanation as reasonable. Okay. Uh, anyone else have thoughts? Um, I think that you know that uh, Robin, go ahead. Yeah, uh, and I agree with what you said too. I think we need to have the date and then be willing to be flexible about that. I have one sort of, maybe it's a total minor question um, when we were going through this and I just wondered if um, if the administration of TIFs is impacted because education property tax is impacted if we did this. Is it just all stay the same or is there any kind of administration of that that changes as a result? Just a passing thought. Uh, Craig, do you have a thought about it? Was, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't know if that was a question for me. I, I've been reading this proposal as taking on just the billing and collection of education property tax at this point, mm -hmm. and not, you know, the underlying assessment and values uh, that I would that I would say TIF might fall into there. But I think that those are the kind of questions that we would shake out in this plan. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm writing notes now to make sure that we get the clerks and treasurers in as well. So um, I'm sensing that people are okay with this approach, still interested in it, um, get sort of wait, yeses, not, not <laughs> something. 
Um, and um, so given that, what I'll, I'll do, and I think Abby's done a really good job drafting and sort of capturing what the issues are. Now, if it turns out that there are more issues that we haven't thought about, we'll be dealing with them when we, you know, when we look at a, a actual proposal. Um, uh, we will get the clerks and treasurers in, and I know that Karen is still on the call, but I don't know whether she is on two different calls. So um, I want to give her a chance to weigh in if she wants to. Hi there. Hi, she's there. Um, I was just about to leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. I, I do think that this uh, proposal is very workable and, and we're happy to, um, you know, uh, work, work on it anyway that's helpful. And I'm also um, actually quite pleased to hear that the Department of Taxes is interested in, in this. That there are gonna be a lot of changes with yeah. the new grand list software. So I hadn't thought of it before, but I, I do think that's an appropriate um, timing yeah. issue right now. Thanks. Yeah, that's useful. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so uh, um, we'll, we'll keep Karen and Craig uh, you know, invited when we take it up again. I, I don't anticipate, and if they want to offer testimony, just let Sorsha know, but I won't schedule you for testimony again on it. Um, but I, we will have the clerks and treasurers in um, to speak about it. Uh, anything else? Any other questions about this? Any other issues people want to bring up? Good work. We'll see you all. I have, I have, I have one thing, Janet. Sure. At, at your level, I mean, um, of course, the governor's starting to open things up. Has, has there been any conversation of, you know, if there might be a time next month or that the legislature might actually get together or come in? Yeah, I don't know. Um, no. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. It seems unlikely, but um, it sure would be nice. Yeah. I, I, people are thinking more July or August. Um, yeah. Okay. We're getting back in the building. My first job is to get my hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you, Bill. I do, don't you do house calls? <laughs> um, Maybe today's pr press conference will open that back up. I, you know, I have an appointment on the 16th, I shouldn't go off on, but anyway, I have an appointment on the 16th and I keep waiting for the announcement that I'm going to be able to get it done. But I don't know. Madam so, Chair, if I might add, if you just shave your head like me, you can just do that from home. I've had no problem. <laughs> yeah, but then I couldn't have a picture up, so. <laughs> get it if, if you're going to get your hair cut. Sorsha, that's your cue to take us offline. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until we talk haircuts. All right, I'm stopping the live stream now. <laughs> Thank you.